Uh, the last time I was in Joburg was uh, 2019 to teach at the MTA. And I think on Sunday, we're together at the Northwest region. Uh, probably spoke from the Book of Romans. My memory doesn't fail me. Uh, before that year, my wife and I were there. And we must spend some great time with the Aguirre's and the Rentons at their home at the Rentons. Wonderful barbecue. And then we later on visited the church in Cape Town. It's just wonderful to reconnect with the wonderful family in the Northwest region, to, region tonight. Thank you so much, Ivo, for the invitation. Ivo is uh, my blood brother. We connected instantly when they came here uh, 2018, the year we were appointed teachers. They came for the Youth and Family Conference, and we connected. We have so much in common, cancer survivors, and plus, plus, many things in common. So tonight is just a joy for my wife and I to be able to spend this time with you guys sharing about the need to serve God in all seasons of life. This is actually a lesson that I had the opportunity to teach exactly a month ago. Today is 20th of May, 20th of April, just about four weeks ago, I was able to speak to singles across the churches in the Philippines uh, during one of their conferences entitled Change. And I was asked to talk about embracing God in all seasons. And I went on later on to speak to campus students in Ghana a few weeks later about serving God with their youth. And so tonight, when I got to find out that our audience is just married because the singles and teens have their own midweek service, it occurred to me that we needed to adapt some of the same principles, but apply them more to the marriage stage of life. So permit me, uh, without wasting any time, to just go ahead and share my screen as we talk about the need to serve God in all seasons of our life. I want to believe that my screen is coming up. And uh, yeah, like you can see, uh, you'll notice that there's an image right there below the title, Serving God in All Seasons of Life. Uh, this image is the same place with trees, but you see it in autumn, you see it in summer, pretty green, the second image. Then, in, uh, no, you see it in spring, first of all, in summer, and then autumn. And the fourth one at the far right is winter, of course, with the snow. And so it's amazing to see that it's the same image. I remember asking the question uh, to the singles back then, what their favorite seasons are and why. Uh, mine is, of course, autumn because I love colors and just the beauty and to see nature just changing. I love spring equally because of the new life that comes out of those dry, dead leaves and trees. And so, uh, but all these seasons bring their blessing. They come with their blessing. So every season is so important. Um, I'll probably ask Ivo to share the link of that lesson. Because I don't want to repeat some of the things I said. There was a beautiful poem that makes that point that every season brings its own blessings. But tonight, we want to be able to take those same principles and apply to different seasons of our life as married, since most of us tonight are married. So without wasting much time, the outline of today's lesson, uh, we're going to talk about some biblical principles, mainly from the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, specifically chapter 7. Uh, Paul sharing some principles that we will take and apply to this topic. Then we'll have a case study in the couple, one of our favorite couples, Priscilla and Aquila. We fell in love with this couple just before we got married. Our sister believed that we were going to be like Priscilla and Aquila for the church here. And so we studied out this character and they become like the model for our marriage. Uh, and then we'll look at the partnership that really characterized their marriage. Uh, their marriage, uh, their partnership in marriage, and also in ministry. Uh, then we'll look at the providence of God through different seasons of life. Then I'd like to talk to the brothers a bit more, even though I believe the sisters will still benefit from this stages of manhood, the blessings and challenges of those stages, and then we'll draw some conclusions and hopefully share some practicals from our lives as we go on. And so moving on here, uh, the biblical principles comes from the book of 1 Corinthians. Like I said, Paul here is saying, I would like you to be free from concern. I'm an unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. As a single person, single stage of life, 
how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And then he says the same thing about women uh, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So right here you see Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul addressing already two groups of people, the singles or the unmarried and the married group. And he talks about the pros and cons of each of those groups. So these are two stages or two seasons. I'll be using stages and seasons almost interchangeably as we share this lesson today. But I want to drive at some principles he comes up with. Uh, right in the beginning of that same chapter, he had talked about some matters that were written that he wrote about. There were some issues about um, marriage. He said it's good for a man not to have sexual relationship with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relationships with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. So this is very appropriate for us marriage. And he carries on and says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her in the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Quite interesting. You see, devotion keeps coming up as a common key word right here. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I want to drive at the principle, so I'll just continue here. Verse 6 says, I see this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widow, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. That's his own position as Paul. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. As a great scripture we often use when we do uh, uh, in our workshops for singles. Nevertheless, each person should leave, um, each person should leave as a believer in whatever situation, excuse me, the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all churches, all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called, he should become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called, he should not be circumcised. So remain in whatever condition you were. And here comes the principle. So the principle we get from everything we've seen here, one of those key principles is wherever we find ourselves, whether in the married condition or unmarried condition, whether circumcised or not, whatever the circumstance we find ourselves in, we could apply to so many areas of life. The principle is use that stage you find yourself in. God can use us whatever situation we find ourselves in. So that's a very key principle right there. And we keep reading here, circumcision is nothing, and circumcision is nothing. Keep God's commands is what counts. Keeping that, that, That's the heart of the matter, is keep God's commands, irrespective of the stage of life. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. And so that's the whole principle. Where, when you were a slave, when you were called, don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's free person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. So slave or free, it doesn't really matter. What matters is keeping God's commands. So we see that even as we read further, you have bought at a price, do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. That's the overriding principle I want you to bring out from this entire chapter, chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. And so, again, another key principle here is 
believers should serve Christ as well as they can in whatever situation they find themselves in. It doesn't matter the stage of life you're in or the season of life you're in. There is no reason to say, I'll begin serving God after this or this happens, after I get married, after I recover from illness, after I get a job, after I retire, after I have children, after I graduate from college. We could add so many other things there where we put conditions on when to serve God. No, Paul is saying we should serve Christ as well as we can in whatever situation we find ourselves. It reminds me of Philippians where he says, hey, I've learned to be content in all conditions, whether wealthy or not, whether in want, whether, you know, well provided for, I've learned to be content. And so we need to find ways of serving God, irrespective of the season we find ourselves in. And this couple is just an incredible example of how to serve God in different seasons, Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, it's a story of love and partnership, like I mentioned earlier on. That example is amazing. You find them in scriptures in Acts 18, where they became acquainted with, uh, this was, uh, the, with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, uh, who had recently arrived in Italy. So he is where we meet them in Acts 18 for the first time. So Paul actually meets them and leaves with them in Corinth. Paul leaves and works with them for the way. Tent makers. So this is like a, a corporate couple. They have a business of their own, activities of their own. Uh, and then later on, we see them staying uh, not only in Corinth with Paul, but they later on moved to Ephesus with Paul. When Paul was leaving Corinth for another city, you find them moving to another city with Paul. Uh, I mean, so many scriptures where you just see them mentioned here. Uh, here you see them they took him aside talking about Apollos and explained the way of the Lord even more accurately. So even though they're not a preacher type of couple, they're the ones that are full of hospitality, bringing people into their homes and sharing the scriptures with them. But they were an incredible support to Paul's ministry. You see Paul when he's writing to the Romans, asking that greetings be sent to Priscilla and Aquila. And you'll find at many times that Priscilla even, even mentioned before Aquila, she seems to be a very influential sister in the Lord. And he calls them his co-workers in the ministry of Christ Jesus. So these are all different scriptures where you see them mentioned. And what we gather from all of these scriptures is that they were a very influential couple who had learned to serve God in different situations in their lives. And so talking about partnership and togetherness, they had this incredible partnership where they learn to serve God irrespective of whatever stage of life they were going through. Uh, I like this slide because it speaks to us as married people, how we can be intimate with each other. When we think of intimacy, we tend to think of physical intimacy. But it's interesting to know that intimacy begins with emotional intimacy. There's intellectual intimacy. The things you talk about, sharing in the world of ideas together. There's creative recreational intimacy, the kind of vacations and memories that you guys create with one another. There's work and crisis intimacy where challenges come in. We go through seasons of challenge and we have to learn to walk through those times together, sharing, you know, common tasks and challenging seasons together. There's spiritual intimacy where we share our deep concerns and we share our walk with God, with each other. We pray together, we study and share lessons with one another. And of course, when all of that is taking place in all these five levels, it builds up, and here comes the climax, the height of oneness, which is the sexual intimacy. I just want to mention a few things about this aspect of togetherness, that togetherness touches all these different aspects of our lives as marriage. The amazing thing about Priscilla and Aquila is that they experience God's providence in different seasons of life, we meet them when they were expelled from Rome, okay? When Claudius was emperor of Rome, uh, Jews and Christians were expelled from Rome, uh, leaving just the Gentile Christians in that church. And so we see them in that difficult stage of life where they're being expelled. They're always like becoming refugees and moving to Corinth to go settle where they, where they met Paul, by the way. 
And so that's an amazing uh, 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 reaction and response to the winter of their lives. They now encounter Paul and they now form an amazing partnership working together that could be qualified as maybe the autumn, the summer, the spring of their lives. But we see a couple that serves God in different seasons. They'll later on move to Ephesus and then later on they get back to Rome. We just see God's sovereign plan in the way he used this couple's life in different seasons that they were going through. Embracing the seasons of life means embracing the one who loves me through every season. So we need to learn to embrace God in all those seasons. There'll be times of illness, there'll be times of financial challenges, and there'll be times of prosperity financially. There'll be times of good health also. But we need to learn to serve God irrespective of the seasons we go through. I want to also quickly drop this few thoughts from a lesson I, I listened to many, many years ago, and I took down some notes. I've been looking for that same audio lesson for a long time now, but this is just a summary of my notes, which I found and decided to put them together here. Talking about some words that generally describe the stages of man's life. So Zeka, coming from the book of Song of Songs, described the sexual stage of life, which applies generally to young people and generally to singles, a stage where they experience the strongest sexual desires. It's a very intense stage of life. And it comes with these blessings. Each stage comes with blessings. The sexual stage is meant to attract us towards our future spouse. So it's not a sin to experience all those desires. They are useful in attracting us towards a partner in order to build a spiritual relationship with that person. But this stage requires that we have self-control because if we don't, you can see in the world that the world is full of negative effects in society of not being able to manage these sexual desires in the sexual revolution, pornography, and all that we see around our world. So the challenge in this uh, stage of life is that sexual perversion. Uh, we have people who grow old, they're 50, 60, and they're still behaving like, like, you know, sleeping around with young girls, people of that, uh, who have the, the age of, the, of, their, of their children. So the whole Playboy movement is because people get stuck in this stage of their life. Unfortunately, some people even get married, but they still want to carry on as if they were still, you know, in that younger stage of life and they're, they're, they're having a fair left, right, center. So this is that first stage of life. You're meant to go past that stage. It has a blessing. And once you apply that blessing and you get attracted to the spouse of your life, you're supposed to move on. And the second stage addresses Gebor. Gebor, the warrior, which generally from a biblical perspective, applies to heads of families. They are married in God's plan. It's actually the heads of families, men who are married, who are warriors. And these are people who want to do great exploits. They want their life to count. Men love heroic things. And so this is a stage of life where they go about doing incredible exploits, but the danger of this stage of life is pride. Uh, if a warrior doesn't draw his strength from God, it's very easy to now use intimidation, personal strength to want to achieve our goals. And that's the danger of this stage of life is the pride that comes with the great exploits that we tend to accomplish at this stage. So this will really apply really well for young marriages. Young marriages here in Lagos, we generally qualify young marriages as uh, from zero to seven years uh, married. They're like in that first stage of their married life. And so uh, this generally applies, but it's amazing because you could be a single and go through uh, the first two stages as a single person. I, I, I stayed a long time before I got married and I was able to actually experience even the warrior stage of life while I was still a single person. And so this applies to that. But I think for us married, it applies a lot more to the marriage stage of life. The third one, Enoch, is the wounded warrior. It's a stage that is generally, uh, people are in their 40s in general when they're at this stage. Uh, they look at their lives and they feel like they haven't accomplished much in terms of their career dreams. Uh, they tend to be cynical, thinking that they have already spent half of their lives and they've not ach achieved their dreams. But there are blessings at this stage. We need to understand at this stage that it's normal. And we need to be great examples of how to navigate that stage of life, understanding that God is not done with us. That is a stage 
that teaches us to depend and rely on God, and it helps us to connect with our human weakness, our fragility. God takes us through this stage of life in order to work on our pride, the pride that comes out of the warrior stage. And so the challenge here is that in the wounded warrior stage, we tend to want to blame, blame shift. Everybody else is responsible for our problem and not us. And so blame shifting, who's responsible for my condition, we tend to blame. And so I, I've gone through this stage of my life. I spent, I just turned 50. And I think in most of my 40s, I did wrestle with this stage of life. You know, there's a tendency to become bitter in this stage of life. But it is a normal stage that we all have to go through as men. And I believe sisters will find this also useful. At least it will help you understand maybe the men and your husband and the stages we go through. That at the minimum, I was amazed that I shared this and some sisters could even apply it to their own stages of life. Interesting. The fourth stage, which is the mature man, the ish stage of life. Here you see a mature man who is endowed with intelligence and wisdom because these are people who have gone through the fire. They've gone through it all and they've been able to overcome. So they, they, they tend to be, become blessings to the fellowship, the season, the fellowship with kindness and wisdom. They've been through it all. And it's a stage of peace, a stage of uh, stability. They are at peace with themselves and with their surrounding. And so being uh, at, at, at this stage of life, they really become a great, great blessing uh, to themselves, to their families, and to the larger church. And I, I dare believe that I, I, I got ushered into the stage of my life. I don't know at one point, but I definitely feel like God has helped me go through the wounded warrior stage and has ushered me into this very critical stage of life. There are two others, and I'm still looking for that uh, lesson to be able to recapture the notes of those last two stages. There's one that is even another level of wisdom. I remember sharing with a sister uh, uh, in the church in Chicago and talking about season, and she's 59. She's in the teaching ministry there uh, in the Midwest, in the U.S., and she feels like Martina. I, I think our brother... Um, Jacques uh, Janice knows her really well. They worked on a project together. Martina believes that she's about to enter the final stage of her life. She's about to turn 60. And for her, she believes that this is a stage of life where almost everything she does, she doesn't expect to harvest the blessings of the seeds she's planting now. She believes that whatever she's doing now will probably bear fruit after she's gone. So she leaves, she's now leaving for God's glory, not for any rewards that she will get for herself. That's the new stage of life she's being ushered into. And so it's just helpful to get, get to know. So this is a sister right there, right? And she feels like that's where she is right now. So it's helpful to know, depending on age and life circumstances, to have an, an approximate idea about what stage of life we're in. And so this leads me to just share a bit about my timeline, and different seasons of life I've been through. Born in Cameroon, 71. I turned 50, as I said, this year. I uh, became a disciple, 92. And between 92 and 2012, I spent almost 20 years as a single person. And during those years, I gave up school. Uh, I first was diagnosed with cancer, gave up school in Germany, came to Africa, served as a missionary for the church, West and Central Africa for 13 full years resigned at some point, went back to school, and then got a job in the corporate world, world and then relocated to Nigeria uh, uh, to build a great relationship with my wife, got married 2012. So for almost 20 years, I spent that whole time. And I realized recently that I moved 15 times minimum in a space of 13 years during that whole season. So you see how my single life bringing the flexibility that comes with the single life that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 7, I think I've maximized mine in terms of being able to move around, serve, impact lives in different countries, different places. Even within Abidjan, I moved 10 times within the same city, leading different ministries. And so uh, that, that was an incredible season of my life. I got married, got a job in the corporate world, had to reinvent myself, uh, got a, a career, in the telecom and IT industry, worked there for like six years, and then had to drop out because we lost uh, our company, went through tough times, 
And so for the past four years, I've invested more time in the teacher ministry, in traveling. That's how I've been to South Africa twice. And I've been doing this course uh, in biblical studies with the Rocky Mountain School of Ministry. Of course, during this whole period of even being in the corporate world, my wife and I have been able to afford it to go to Israel, to Turkey, to Greece, travel to Europe for Bible study tours with Douglas Jacobi. We've used this season of our life in an incredible way. Uh, when we turned nine as, as married uh, in April last month, I put together a, a video to just say thank you to my wife. And I noticed that we've been to so many countries, created so many memories during this stage of our life before God blessed us in 2018 with our son, Joseph, whom we adopted December uh, 2018. And so this is a new stage as parents in our lives. And then the pandemic came and I had to learn to gravitate or, 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 or kind of move from not being able to travel to now doing a lot of teaching online, reinventing myself along those lines. Spoke to over 20 countries last year for the past one year. Uh, just came up with a website recently. Basically, what I'm trying to share with my timeline is the need to continuously invent ourselves, adapt to new life circumstances. And I want to invite my wife to really share some of the lessons she's also learned through these different stages of life that we've gone through. <clears throat> and then the conclusion, once my wife is able to share, is finding out what stage of life or season you're in at each stage, adapting your service to each life phase. Now that we're parents, we're completely having to adjust our whole time table. My, my wife wrote an article that came out of Disciples today, and she called parenthood a welcome disruption. Whether you like it or not, we all know for those who are parents that parenthood does disrupt the life that we live till we became parents, but it's a welcome disruption. So we've got to adapt and learn and find new ways to serve, irrespective of the season we're going through. Rely on God's providence. When I, it's time of, when I lost my job, for example, four years ago, it was a challenging season. And we needed to trust and rely on God to provide. That was a lesson in that season of our life. Building great partnerships and friendships. There's no way I would have been able to cope through all these different seasons, even for us as a couple, without being friends and partners as a couple, but also having partners with other couples, with other friends. My wife has great friends in her life. I have incredible friends that keep me grounded through all of the ups and downs of life. I've had my struggles with sin, and I've had brothers rally around me and help me come out of that season of my life and move on to the next one. And my wife loves this particular point here. We've got to take every new stage of life, every new season with grace. Because it's life. Life is made up of seasons. And we've got to face each of those seasons with a lot of grace. I pray this is helpful. And to God alone be the glory. Thank you.